This is the Ruby VM a speedrun. Let's go ahead and get started. So to sort of add to that intro, uh, my name is Penelope Fippin. Uh, I'm Penelope Zone basically everywhere on the internet. I use she or they pronoun sets, uh, and I am trans, and I use like Demifem as my gender identity label, and you can look that up if you want to find out more. Um, so as I was writing this talk, it became sort of like increasingly circuitous uh, as we began to think about like uh, abstractions and compilers and how stuff relates to uh, the Ruby virtual machine. And so I promise you we will get there and we will look at some of the detail, but I'm going to talk about a bunch of other stuff that I think is interesting and related first. Um, also, this talk is perhaps less educational and less practical uh, than the previous one, but I it, there is a bunch of really interesting stuff uh, in here, and so I hope you find it interesting. Um, we're going to be talking a lot about notions of abstraction today, and if you take one thing away from this, uh, it is very much Lee that like when you are writing Ruby, you are leveraging on top of just incredibly, unbelievably powerful layers of abstraction in the CPU and the compiler and your computer. And that like, it is truly amazing that we can write software in the language of our products uh, and that it all actually works. Um, so with that, let's kind of get a little bit into the meat here. Um, we're talking about the Ruby VM today. And when we say Ruby, I think, we understand what that is. It's the lines of code we write. It's how we execute. It's our Rails apps. It's the database. And so I kind of want to like zoom in on the VM part. And very specifically, like when we think about VM, that stands for virtual machine. And that like virtual is an adjective. So that we can throw that out as well and really zoom in on just the M here or like the machine part in virtual machine. And when, when we talk about the machine, what we're actually talking about, right, is one of these. It's a computer. And like, just looking at this picture of a computer, right, you can begin to see that like, it's broken into constituent parts. And like, I could obviously like, rip open your MacBook and show you the circuit board on the inside. But like, it's a little harder with a, a laptop, which is fundamentally like a, a very powerful embedded system to begin to discretize uh, the components, right? Whereas with something like a gaming computer, it's really easy. I can point to the graphics card, I can point to the power supply, but like, we're not really talking about those today, right? We're really focused on this thing over here. And I don't mean the CPU fan. And obviously here, like, this is actually an Intel stock cooler. Nobody would ever put this inside a serious gaming computer. I have no idea why this is in here. But no, we're talking about the thing that's underneath this, right? The CPU. And giving this talk actually has become more complicated because Apple has now released their M1 processors. And obviously, they're like, M1 processors share a very different lineage to, like, what we have traditionally thought of as a, a desktop CPU. So I'm just going to pretend those don't exist and, and zoom in <laughs> really speci oh, specifically on like Intel CPUs, right? And if you, if you take this um, metal top off this thing and look underneath it, you'll see like a little black square of silicon. And if you then zoom in again on that little black square of silicon, um, you'll see something that looks like this. Right? This is actually what uh, you see when you like image the CPU in your computer itself. And I've added here a bunch of like labeling pieces to show like CPU cores and, and different pieces of the system. And I just want to pause here and point out something we just looked at, right? We looked at a computer, we identified a component and we zoomed in. And then we looked at the CPU and we identified different components and we zoomed in, right? And that like this notion of these things being organized logically is not foreign to us as software engineers, right? When you're writing a Rails application, you are building models and views and controllers, and you are logically organizing your system based on something that makes sense to you. And that turns out to be true, like at literally every level of the stack, right? It's not just true in the front ends where we use CSS and HTML and JavaScript to separate concerns. It's not just true in the Rails apps. 
Uh, it's also true in literally how the physical transistors on the CPU are laid out. There is a reason the IO stuff is far away from the graphic stuff in this diagram. It's the information has to logically flow through the system. And I just think it's like really interesting and important to understand that like this notion of building these layers of abstraction applies at literally every layer of our systems. Um, so Intel CPUs are programmed in a programming language called x86 assembly. And there is a reason for that, right? This, this Intel CPU that we're looking at is actually not so fundamentally different from this thing. This is an Intel 8086 that was first built in 1978. Um, and, and it is true that I can take a program written for this piece of hardware, this little blob of plastic, and run it on my Intel laptop today. Right? This processor from 1978 fundamentally runs exactly the same programming language, this Intel x86 assembly, as my laptop does today. Now, the same is not true in reverse. It turns out that Intel has added features over time. And so like, I can't take a modern program it and execute it on an old CPU, but we can, we can move things from old to new. And I think that's really cool. And if we do the same trick, if we zoom in on, on this CPU, you can see it's also logically organized. I don't have a diagram here, unfortunately, but like you can see, right, the layout on the top left and the bottom right are completely different. And the CPU is also organized into sort of like logical units. And so this is where I, I bring it back to what we're actually talking about today, right? We intuitively understand that the processor doesn't execute Ruby directly, right? There are many layers between the Ruby programming language and actually running this on the processor. And I want to just like look at a couple of those, right? So I mentioned that this thing executes x86 assembly. Um, x86 is what's called a register-based architecture. And, and really what that means is that like the only way to sort of like manipulate values is when they are in a piece of memory called a register that can only hold one value. Imagine if you had to write all of your Ruby programs where you can only have four local variables and those local variables can't be arrays or dictionaries. That's basically what a register is. It's a single scalar value. Uh, our x86 assembly looks something like this where we have instructions and they have arguments, right? So this MOV instruction is used to like load a value into the register, right? And EAX here is the name of a register. So executing this instruction, uh, MOV EAX5, uh, will store the value five in that register, right? And so if we execute this program from top to bottom, we'll move the value five into the register EAX, we'll move the value three into the register EBX, and then we'll come to ad addition. And you might be like, well, Penelope, Addition is like result equals thing plus thing. And I only see two arguments here. What's going on? In order to save space and be as terse and minimal as possible, assembly languages often have shortcuts um, that enable them to let you write less code to be more precise with your instructions. So in this case, the result is actually just going to end up in the first argument, which will also be used as an input. So in this case, we'll say like five plus three equals eight, and we'll store the result directly in this EAX register. So that's the concrete machine, right? We have this assembly code. It's very low level. We're directly programming transistors. Let's come back to virtual machines. The job of a virtual machine is to abstract like a programming language away from any specific concrete processor, right? And we understand that like, Ruby has a virtual machine and that Ruby is also not directly coupled to running on an Intel CPU, right? It can also run on ARM, it can run on Linux, it can run in all kinds of different places, right? But the thing that's kind of like important to understand is when we run the Ruby command, that is not the virtual machine. This thing here is not the Ruby virtual machine. This is the Ruby interpreter, which is itself made of many pieces of which the virtual machine is a part. Um, so like what Ruby is actually going to do is compile your program to Ruby VM instructions and then execute them. And that the Ruby VM is only one part of the Ruby interpreter. So let's take a look at some of the other parts. Let's imagine we have this Ruby program three plus five. Like 
that's our Ruby source code, right? And we know that that's going to evaluate and give us the result eight, the same as the assembly program we saw before. But the very first thing Ruby is going to do when we throw this program into the interpreter is it's going to turn it into what's called an AST or abstract syntax tree. You can think of the AST as a data structure, which represents the program in a way that is more amenable to compilation and execution. To make this concrete, you can actually ask Ruby to show you the AST representation of any given program. So here I'm going to run Ruby dump AST uh, and get this back, right? This is an actual screenshot from running the Ruby interpreter on my laptop. And you can see here, right, we have the body of our program, the plus has been parsed out, the three is in there, and so is the five. Without thinking too much about the detail of what we're seeing here, we can begin to intuitively understand that when we give the Ruby interpreter three plus five, it's going to create a data structure that looks something like this, where the plus comes first and then the arguments are like secondary in it. And hopefully you can see intuitively that scanning this from left to right is much easier to evaluate this addition than doing it with the plus sign in the middle. But maybe to make that more concrete, imagine we have a structure like three plus five times six. Well, now the addition actually needs to happen after the multiplication. And so what Ruby's parser is going to do is actually create a data structure that looks more like this thing here, where the multiplication is nested within the addition. Now, if we scan this left to right, we can encounter the plus, we can encounter the three. And then when we encounter this like nested expression, we're going to save the fact that we're doing this somewhere else, evaluate this multiplication as we would usually evaluate the addition doing, you know, times five, six, put that result back in the place of the original and then complete the evaluation, right? And so that like by doing this, we have now made the program much more amenable to execution than it originally was in the raw source form. Um, this notation, by the way, is called Polish notation and it comes from like an interesting branch of compiler theory. If you're interested in finding out more about this, uh, this is a great place to look. Um, and hopefully you can see that intuitively, the abstract syntax tree is easier to evaluate than pure Ruby source code. So what's going to happen in Ruby after we've uh, created this abstract syntax tree is we're now going to compile it into Ruby virtual machine instructions. Virtual machine instructions are very much like the assembly we looked at for x86, just targeting the Ruby virtual machine instead of targeting the processor directly. So let's take a look at that. We have our AST that's compiled into virtual machine instructions. And before we look at what these look like in Ruby, I just kind of want to show you again a slide of like assembly code so we can compare and contrast, right? Here we have instructions and arguments, and we're using registers to target where values are flowing. So again, we can have Ruby dump the instructions out of its execution, and we'll get something like this. And notice, right, this looks really similar to the assembly code. We have put object, which is an instruction, and we have the argument three, similar for the value five, and then we have opt plus representing our addition. And like one thing you might notice here is that like there's only one argument in any of these instructions, right? Where put object is our instruction and three is our argument. We only have the one argument. We don't have a register we're targeting. And that's because uh, in Ruby virtual machine instructions, there are no registers. Ruby actually doesn't have registers like the uh, x86 uh, CPU does. Uh, Ruby instead has this concept of a stack. And so where we're calling put object, what that's actually going to do is basically put that value on a, a continuously growing evaluation stack, right? And so executing this program, after we've executed uh, put object three, we're going to have three on the stack. Then we're going to call put object five and put five on the stack. And then we're actually going to go into running this addition, right? So like now we're going to pull values off the stack. This is a different way of dealing with local data from the register model we looked at earlier. Um, you might also notice that the arg count to this addition is one, and that doesn't really immediately make sense, right? Addition takes multiple arguments, right? You can't just add a number on its own. Um, this is because all methods in Ruby have a self. And the value at the top of the stack when the method is called is the self object. And so this three and five on the stack that we were looking at, these are actually the Ruby objects for those numbers. Um, 
the thing is like even lambdas in ruby have a self like literally everything has a self there is no way in ruby to have a callable uh without a self and this is just like an important thing to know so this arg c of one is actually like just the, the argument five and the value three is going to be the self of this call so when evaluating this uh, opt plus invocation, we're going to take the value five off the stack for the arg c, and then we're going to take the value three off the stack as the self uh, for the addition call. We're then going to run addition uh, and push the result eight back onto the stack, and then we're going to encounter the leave instruction. The leave instruction basically tells Ruby to finish the current function that it's executing and return the value at the top of the stack if there is any. The other thing that's interesting to note here, right, is that a concrete piece of hardware can't have an infinitely growing stack. And this is one of the characteristics of what it means for Ruby to be a virtual machine. The implementation of this Ruby virtual machine that I just showed you doesn't target any particular piece of hardware. Instead, it defines an abstract machine that we can use to execute Ruby on any individual piece of hardware by translating this Ruby code into assembly instructions. So let's just talk about what we covered here today, right? I told you at the beginning, this was a talk fundamentally about abstraction. And we looked at how hardware is laid out inside a computer. We looked at the fact that CPUs are arranged into logical units. We talked a little bit about how Rails applications like allow us to organize our code logically. But also like when we write Ruby code, we are writing this beautiful high level dynamic programming language that is hiding vast, vast pieces of machinery from us. And that's a really good thing, right? Like we don't have to care too much about like Ruby being incredibly detailed about how the machine is working. We can just think about what it is we're trying to get to get done. When we run a Ruby program, it gets compiled into an AST that uh, somehow rearranges our program into a data structure that is amenable for execution. And then that data structure gets compiled into virtual machine instructions that let us uh, run Ruby on whatever architecture we care about. Now, I didn't get into a ton of the implementation detail of Ruby today, but like just to show you what this opt plus thing actually looks like, this is the C source code of uh, opt plus in the Ruby virtual machine. I don't expect you to read and understand this. Um, I instead just want to point out that like this is actually much closer to the assembly we were looking at earlier. Um, C is basically like kind of a high level assembly and is one way of thinking about it. And that like Ruby is doing incredible, incredible work on our behalf. So yeah, this, this Ruby virtual machine thing is really cool. Um, it's built on top of all of these amazing and powerful layers of abstraction. I think it's really neat. Um, that's all I got. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Um, very specifically, my team at Stripe is hiring. So if you would like to work with me on weird and crazy backend infrastructure things, uh, there's my email address or ping me in Slack. Um, that's all I got. Thank you so much for listening.